recap from uh, from where we are in Paul's total correspondence or relationship with the Corinthian church. Uh, Paul starts the Corinthian church and spends about 18 months there in Acts chapter 18. And then uh, writes the first Corinthians, the letter of first Corinthians to them in response to a bunch of issues and problems that he starts to hear about over the next couple of years while he's away from them. And then the, that first letter that we're going to be finishing in just a minute doesn't uh, produce the results that Paul wants. The, the, the people don't all repent or don't all respond and, uh, and fix the issues. And so Paul makes a visit after that uh, that he had hoped would go well, but because of the lack of response to the letter and just general stubbornness, uh, this, pain, this visit ends up being very painful. It's lots of conflict, lots of confronting issues instead of being able to encourage and, and spend time together and enjoy each other and, and all those kinds of things. And so this visit ends up being a, a painful visit and is followed up by a, a second letter that uh, Paul describes as causing sorrow or tears in the, some of the people at Corinth. And so it's called the tearful letter. Uh, and then after that, apparently this, the combination of this visit or the, the whole suite, the first Corinthians painful visit and tearful letter, so eventually in, in with all of that, the Corinthian church responds and they, they fix what was, what was most uh, important, some of the biggest issues. And so Paul writes 2 Corinthians to assure them of his um, good intentions towards them and that he has forgiven many of them that have wronged him or that have said anything against him or said anything that is uh, painful and that basically that he has forgiven them and uh, to encourage them to forgive one another and to forgive the uh, one of the major instigators apparently is uh, specifically encouraged them to forgive him. Uh, and then to encourage them uh, to take part in a collection for the church at Jerusalem that we'll talk about in a little bit. And then finally to reassure them, uh, it's kind of, he defends himself against some of the accusations, but does it in order to reassure the church that he, uh, that the message that they received from him, the gospel that they received was worthwhile and worth, worth hearing, even though they, there were, cons people were, were bothered or upset or, or not impressed by Paul, that, that he was not as impressive as some of those that came after him. And so that's, we'll, we'll look at 2 Corinthians when we get, get there. Um, first though, we're gonna finish with 1 Corinthians, and you'll, if you paid attention, you had close attention the other day, you'll, you'll note that the way that I have these, these sections labeled is a little different today. Um, it, it's just highlighting something different, so it's not, it's not a, a major change, but it's, it's just highlighting it from the other direction, basically. And so the first major section, Paul deals with factions that had started up in the church that some were saying, you know, I follow Paul and others Apollos and others Cephas or Peter. And then some were saying, I follow Christ. And so basically everybody had aligned behind their favorite teacher, whoever they thought was the, the right teacher to follow. And that aligning behind these various teachers, even though many of them were actually that opposed to each other or, or just were difference in style more than in content, uh, they, it, it caused a lot of infighting and a lot of conflict in the church. And so Paul was writing to say you know, that you, you should not be divided in this way over these things. That you should be unified. And so the, his way of arguing is basically that the gospel should lead to unity. That being in Christ together, in, in light of what Christ has done for us, in light of the gospel that we've received, we should be unified. We should be one. Uh, and Specifically, he will point that you know, at that point there's this kind of suggestion that some don't find him particularly that impressive. And so he addresses that in this letter and says that the, the, the gospel of a crucified king, uh, hung naked in public is in humiliation to die, should not lead you to expect an extremely impressive looking person to be your leader in this. Uh, and so that's the gospel doesn't lend itself to or doesn't automatically connect with a a very impressive, well-polished uh, speaker or teacher. And so don't expect the best leaders or teachers in the church in uh, regarding the gospel to be super polished and, and super well-spoken. Uh, and so the, the first major section in dealing with their discord and their conflicts is gospel should lead to unity. Uh, the second section deals with some uh, major issues surrounding sexual immorality primarily. 
uh, and uh, there's one one guy in particular that Paul points out or, or deals with and that is sleeping with his stepmother, his father, his father's wife, uh, and so he you know, points out or his his argument is basically that the gospel, uh, re having received the gospel, understanding the gospel should lead us to sexual morality or sexual fidelity, uh, and that. You know, Basically, because we have received the gospel, we know that Christ has died in our place, that Christ has given his, his life for us, and so we are not our own. We, we have been bought by Christ, by, by Christ's death on our behalf. We, are, we belong to him now, and so we can't just do whatever we want with ourselves anymore. And more than that, because we are, have received the gospel, we know that we are now part of the body of Christ, that the, all believers are part of the church, the body of Christ. Uh, so since we are part of the body of Christ, whatever we do with our own bodies pulls Jesus into. And so because we are part of the body of Christ, whatever we do, the body of Christ does. And so if we, we do something, if we are sexually immoral, then we drag Christ into that relationship. And so the gospel, what we know and believe about the gospel, should lead us to sexual fidelity or to, to sexual uh, behaving morally and, and wisely uh, sexually. And then the third chunk is mostly surrounding an issue with uh, meat that has been, or food that's been sacrificed to an idol. Uh, and, but it's the, the primary issue or the, the deeper issue is around what the meaning of freedom is. What does it mean that we are free in Christ, that we've been set free from uh, the law or the Old Testament law? Uh, what does that freedom look like? And so Paul's, uh, what Paul ultimately comes down to is if, you, if there's no other concerns involved and it's just that the meat has been sacrificed to an idol, eat and be free. That's fine uh, because we don't believe that an idol is anything. It's, it's a hunk of rock or metal or, or wood that's been carved to look like something and that people have some feelings about. But it's just a thing. And whether the meat was sacrificed to that or just killed to be eaten, it does, doesn't matter. It's, it's equivalent to as far as we're concerned. It's just meat. Eat it. It's fine. You're free. But if there's somebody else there who, or there's somebody else around or who, will, who knows about your eating it that will be uh, harmed by your eating it, that their conscience will be disturbed by it, or that they will be confused about what, what Christians believe or what the gospel looks like because you're eating this meat sacrificed to idol then out of love for them, be willing to surrender this, this aspect or this part of your own freedom for their sake. And be willing to restrain yourself and to be self-disciplined and to, to deny yourself in this moment for their sake, out of love. And so you are free, and so have freedom, but also be ready and willing, as Christ did, to surrender that freedom for others' sake. And so that if you're following the one who, who gave up himself in order to uh, secure your freedom, to be willing to give up yourself or give up some of your freedoms to make sure that they have a chance, others have a chance at that freedom as well. Uh, so meat sacrifice to idol is fine. Eat it, be free, unless that freedom is going to hurt someone else and then be self-disciplined self and self-restrained and give up that freedom for their sake. And then the uh, last chunk that we were looking at the other day that we got through, uh, had to do with uh, the some some chaos that was happening in the gatherings and the worship services of the church, um, and they there was one part of it that had to do with the uh, with communion or the Lord's Supper, and the, the tradition or the the practice at the time was for everyone to bring food, uh, to bring and and basically provide or supply a meal, uh, and then share the meal amongst all of the, the members of the church, and then as part of that, do the Lord's Supper, the, the words of institution, and, and celebrates the, the meal together, uh, and then break the bread and, and drink of the cup to remember what Jesus had done. And so that was the practice at the time, was to have the Lord's Supper in the context of an actual supper, an actual meal, and to have that as, as shared amongst all of the believers. Well, in the Corinthian church, it appears that the that some had started, instead of bringing a meal to share with all, they were bringing, the wealthy were bringing an extremely large amount of food, but then keeping it all for themselves, and then bringing, also bringing a lot of wine, but keeping it all for themselves. And so they would, they would gorge, they would overeat, they would drink too much and get, get drunk. Uh, and some of the poorer members of the church would come and they would have next to nothing for the meal, and they would look and see these other wealthier members just gorging themselves and not sharing. And Paul says that's not at all what the gospel is. That's not at all what the gospel looks like. That's a total abuse of the Lord's Supper. 
Uh, if you are hungry, if you really genuinely are hungry, then eat when you're at home. Eat before you come. You said, those, especially you that are wealthy and can eat before you come, and then come and bring your food and share it. You know, don't don't come starving and then hoard everything to yourself, uh, or come and, and hoard everything to yourself and get drunk and be a glutton. But come and share what you have. And if you're hungry, eat before you come uh, to make sure that you can share freely. Uh, so that because that's that's not at all what the the gospel should look like, and not at all what the the Lord's Supper is. It's an embodiment and a remembrance of Christ's death for us, His generosity, His ultimate generosity for us. You can't sit at this table and hoard for yourself while celebrating Christ's generosity to you. That doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. And so then goes on in the next section, and that's mostly chapter 11, then chapter 12, uh, deals with the use of spiritual gifts and, and that we are the body of Christ and that Christ has given each member or each part of the body different gifts and that they're all to use those gifts for the upbuilding and the, the, the strengthening of the whole. That uh, you should use whatever gifts the Spirit gives you, whatever gifts God gives you, to build up the whole body of Christ. And then that brings us to the next chunk, which is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is one of the best known and best loved passages in the New Testament. And if you, some of you may already know what this is, and already know mostly what the contents is. And if you have been to very many weddings in your life, you have almost certainly heard this passage at some point. Uh, so it's, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and uh, it's essentially, it is the love chapter is what it's usually called. Uh, people call it the love chapter because it is primarily about, or it's all about love. What love looks like, what it is, and how important love is as kind of a central feature, or se the, the central thing in the, the Christian way of life. And so he said, it starts with, I will, now I will show you the most excellent way. And then he points, starts referring to a bunch of these, these gifts of the Spirit that he's just talked about in the previous chapter. And he said, basically, that if you use those, if you do anything with those, but not out of love, if you, if you don't use those gifts in love, then they're nothing. They, they don't matter. They're just, they're just wasting time and energy. And so it starts, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, and so he's talking about the speaking in other tongues that other people can't understand, uh, which is... You know, was very impressive. It was this thing that suddenly started happening. It was very impressive. Lots of people saw it and were, were amazed by it. But if it was done and not out of love, Paul says, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. It's just a noise. And so if you, if you speak in tongues, but you do it without love, that it's not out of love for those around you, then it's just a noise. It, it's just a bunch of racket. Uh, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And so if, if I can speak well, if I'm, if I'm really polished and I'm, everybody can hear me and it, it's very, you know, everybody can, you know, is very impressed by the way that I speak uh, and I, I, I have great insights and all, all these things. Uh, and I, even if I have faith in it and the faith that can move mountains, but I don't love, then all of that is, is meaningless. None of that matters if it's not on the basis of love. And if I give all that I possess to the poor, even if I'm incredibly generous and give everything that I own to those who are poor, but I, I don't do it out of love, even that is meaningless. It's pointless. If I don't give out of love. And even if I give my, my body over to hardship that I may boast, or as in the old translation, even if I give my body over to be burned, if I'm, if I'm willing to go over and die, but I don't do it out of love, then I gain nothing. None of that matters. None of the most impressive spiritual gifts or the, the most pious actions or most obviously spiritual actions, none of those things matter if they aren't done out of love. Love is the only motive that will give any of those things value. And then he goes on to describe love over the next several verses. It's, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And so love is all of these things. That, that's what love looks like when you, when you practice it, when you do it. This is what love looks like. And if what you're doing isn't that, then it's probably not love. And he says, 
but there, where there are prophecies, they will cease. And where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. So he's pointing out that these other gifts, they're, they're kind of temporary things. Uh, and he goes on and says, if we, we, for now we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part will disappear. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put away the, the ways of childhood. For now, we see only as a reflection in the mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And so he says all of these gifts that the Spirit gives for now to build up the church now, they are only partial. They aren't, they aren't complete. And when Christ comes, when Jesus comes, and he is here fully, when, when we're in his presence fully, and the completeness has come, there won't be any need for further revelation, for more prophecy. We won't need someone to speak on God's behalf. He will speak, and we will hear. We won't need someone to teach us about God. He will be there. We will see and we will know. And we won't need these, these things that are for the, this interim time before Christ comes. All of these gifts, the speaking in tongues, the prophecy, the, the teaching, all of that is because for now we need it. But it isn't eternal. It's not, it's not permanent. Someday these things will pass away because he himself will be here. And so he says you know, when, when these things come, when, when the completeness comes, these other things will, will pass away. And if they're going to pass away, they can't be the main thing. They can't be the thing that matters most. And so he says, so these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And so the, the whole point or the, the thrust of the chapter is that whatever you do, anything else that you do, if it's not on the basis of love, however good it looks, however polished it looks, however obviously pious or, or generous or whatever else it looks, if it's not on the, done on the basis of love, it doesn't matter. It, it's, it's not permanent. And so it, it won't matter. So whatever you do, do it on the basis of love. And then he turns and looks at the, the practices in worship specifically and points out how they should be done differently on the basis of love in order to build up the whole church. And so if you are speaking in tongues, if there's if there someone that has the gift of tongues and they're, they're prepared to speak in tongues, then if... If it's in the church gathering, it should only be, you should only speak in tongues if there is someone to interpret. Because if you don't, you're speaking in, in this tongue or this language that no one else can understand. And if no one else can understand it, then no one else can be edified by what is said. If there, if there isn't meaning, if there isn't understanding, then no one else can be built up from it. No one else can be encouraged by it or strengthened or caught by it. And so if there's no interpretation, then keep your tongues to yourself and pray silently. If you're praying to God, you're speaking to God, and you're speaking in tongues, fine. Do it silently, unless there's someone there to interpret. Otherwise, it just draws attention to you and takes up time and doesn't actually edify anybody else. Doesn't actually build anybody else up. And so, if they're speaking in tongues, there must be interpretation. Otherwise, it's of no value, and it's not being done out of love. It's just attention grabbing. And if there is... You know, prophesying or teaching, words of knowledge or encouragement, if, if there's someone that has been given a spiritual gift to speak and to teach in some way or to tell or to proclaim in some way, then it needs to be, that needs to be done decently and orderly as well. It needs to be done, you know, in basic kindergarten terms, you need to take turns. Uh, instead of having everybody that speaks, you know, just jump up and speak whenever they feel like it and interrupt each other and cut each other off in the middle of a message, have two or three people speak, plan to have two or three people speak at, at each gathering and take your turns. So that each, what each person says, what each person has been given by God to say can be heard by the whole body and the whole body can be built up uh, and encouraged and strengthened and taught. Uh, because that is, that is what's best for the body and so that is what, what love would do. Love seeks the good of others. And so that's the, do these things, uh, Conduct worship in this way, conduct worship in an orderly way, your gatherings in an orderly way, in order to make sure that everyone is encouraged and strengthened as much as possible through it, because that, that's why God has given the gifts, and that is the, the practice of love, to make sure that others are strengthened by the gifts. And then the, the last chunk that, that gets through the, the love and then kind of circled back to order and worship, but 
the last chunk in 1 Corinthians is the resurrection. And, and it appears that some at some point, some of the teachings that had been passing through, some of the teachers that had come through, uh, had been teaching something that led many, <clears throat> many in the church at Corinth to start to doubt whether people would be raised from the dead or not. Uh, to doubt whether people would be raised after, if a believer died, whether they would be raised from the dead. And even to come to doubt whether Jesus himself had been raised from the dead. And so Paul has to address them and has to address that problem in Acts, uh, or in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he starts out by, by reminding them of the gospel that he had proclaimed to them, that, that he, had, he had taught them and that they had, had believed at first. And so he says, I, I received, for what I received, this is 15 verse 3 and following, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he, raised, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So he points out that Christ's death and the Christ's resurrection were both, both taught or both, both foreshadowed in the Old Testament in the scriptures. And so he, he had taught them and shown them that. And so I, I, what I received, what I learned, the, the gospel that I received, I passed on to you, that Christ died for us, that Christ was buried, that on the third day he rose again. And then that he appeared to Cephas or to Peter, that he started to appear to his disciples. It wasn't just that we say he rose from the dead, but nobody saw him, but he appeared to Peter and then to the 12 disciples, to, to the rest of the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. And so at some point in, the, in that period, some point after Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to a large crowd. And he goes to Paul, goes on and says, after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep or died. And so he says, you know, Paul, Jesus appeared to this crowd of 500 people resurrected. And there's enough of them, most of them are still alive so that you can go and check out my story. You know, if, you, if you don't believe it or you're having trouble believing it, then there are 500 or there were 500 witnesses that saw Jesus all at once. And enough of them are still alive that you can go and corroborate this. And then he, he says, and then he appeared to James, his brother, the, the brother of Jesus. Uh, and then, then to all the apostles. And then last of all, he appeared to me, Paul, also, as to one abnormally born. And he's referring to his experience on the road to Damascus when he was going to arrest Christians, and Jesus speaks to him and knocks him off his horse, and he's blind for a little while after that. And so you know, Jesus showed himself to me at even, even after he had ascended. And so he showed himself to me as to one abnormally born. Uh, and from that he says, and because of that, I'm, I am the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I had to be knocked flat while I was on my way to persecute the church. And you know, I, I once persecuted the church. And no one, no one worked as hard as me to wipe them out. Uh, but by the grace of God, by, by God's gracious gift, I am what I am. And then he says, but, but there were all these witnesses. Obviously, Jesus is raised from the dead. But if the dead aren't raised, if the dead can't be raised, then Christ can't be raised. And so if, that, if Christ is raised, if Jesus was raised from the dead then that means that the dead can be raised, and there's no reason to believe that, that we can't be raised, or that those who have died in Christ can't be raised from the dead. And he kind of finishes off this kind of sequence in, in chapter 15, verse 19, and says, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we are of all people most to be pitied. And we have put our hope and our trust in the wrong thing. Uh, but Christ is indeed raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And so first fruits is the first crop of the ground, right? Uh, it was you were supposed to bring the first fruits as an offering to God, and so Jesus has the first fruits of those uh, from the dead, the first first of those risen from the dead. Uh, he he is the first among many. It's, it's not it's the first uh, first of the crop, and the rest of the crop is to come. And so by calling Jesus the first fruits from the dead, he's he's saying Jesus was only the first. There is more to come. Uh, the rest of the crop will come in. Uh, so so basically, Christ is raised. There's, there's abundant evidence that Christ is raised. And so we have every reason to have confidence that all those who die in, in their faith die while they believe in Christ. And those who come to believe and then die, they will be raised as well. That we will all be raised. And even Paul finishes out with this section uh, that the, 
the bodies that we'll be raised into will be like Christ's resurrected body, that we will be like him uh, when we are raised. And then he quotes from the Old Testament a section that is uh, really frequently quoted and, and very encouraging this section in this context from Hosea. It says, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Uh, thanks be to God. He has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's the end of, of this section. And then Paul, uh, in the last chapter, in chapter 16, uh, encourages them to, uh, to take up a collection to send back to the church in Jerusalem. Uh, it turns out that the church in Jerusalem is struggling during this time. There's, there's uh, a food shortage in Jerusalem. There's not enough food to go around. Uh, and uh, a lot of the Jewish merchants don't want to sell to the Christians or to the believers. And so they're, because of the food shortage, they're kind of hoarding food and giving it to, to the, the other Jews, you know, the, the other non-Messianic, the ones that don't believe Jesus is Messiah. Uh, and so there's, there's kind of this prejudice against uh, followers of Jesus in Jerusalem, and so they're getting left out of, of the opportunity to buy even a bigger amount of food that's there. And so Paul is trying to take up this offering to make sure that the church in Jerusalem has enough to buy what they need, to get what they need, and even if they afford it, or whatever. But, and to, he, so he's trying to collect from these churches that he has helped to start and he's had influence in. So this, this sweep of Gentile churches, or primarily Gentile churches, uh, to give and bring back to Jerusalem to take care of the believers there. And so he makes that request to them and asks them to, to start setting aside weekly uh, in, in keeping with however much money you make, whatever your income is, set aside a little bit every week to give so that when I come, there will be an offering ready and it won't be you know, a hardship to, to gather an offering. Uh, and then there's some kind of final greetings uh, to Timothy. Uh, he warns them or tells them that Timothy is coming and asks them to take care of him when he comes. And then Apollos, the, Apollos has said that he can't come immediately, but he will be coming later, and so look for him when he comes. Uh, and then the household of Stephanus uh, to, to send greetings to them and, or to encourage them. Uh, and then he sends a few, few final greetings. And then the last four verses of 1 Corinthians is, uh, if you remember a couple, several sessions back now before Romans, before we got into Romans very much, we talked about Paul's, the structure of Paul's letters, and one of the things that was in the conclusion is sometimes Paul will, will put in a postscript in his own hand, he'll write something at the very end of the letter in his own handwriting instead of using the scribe or the amanuensis. And 1 Corinthians has, has one of these. It's 1 Corinthians uh, 16, 21 and following. It says, I, Paul, write this reading in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be first. Come, Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so it's just four, four quick lines that Paul writes in his own handwriting at the end to assure them that he is the one actually writing. And so that's the end of 1 Corinthians. Are there any questions from, from any of that? All right. Second Corinthians. Uh, we've already talked quite a bit about the background with it, but just to, to make sure we got it as we dig into it, uh, Second Corinthians is written after this this whole set of correspondence. The First Corinthians trying to correct the problems, the, it fails, and so he he has a, a painful visit with them, and then writes another letter. Uh, and it appears that something in all that sweep works, it clicks, and most of the believers in Corinth. Uh, get on board, they correct the mistakes, they correct the problems. Uh, they even have to discipline one of the, the men in the church uh, specifically and put him out for a while. And part of what Paul's doing in 2 Corinthians, one of the things that he does is encourage them to, to welcome him back and that he's repented. Uh, but something in here works, and most of the believers in Corinth fix their, their issues, repent, and come back in line. And so Paul writes 2 Corinthians, and a big chunk of what he's doing in 2 Corinthians, in fact, almost half of the book, is uh, about the reconciliation between Paul and this church, that you know, they've been upset with him, or he's been upset with them. There's been, been conflict between them, and so he writes, and a lot of, a bulk of, a big chunk of the book, uh, almost half of it, is reassuring them of their relationship with him, reassuring him of the, the reconciliation between them. And it, it has a very short introduction. This is Paul's third letter to them in a fairly short period of time. And so he's not, he's, there is no extended introduction or extended conclusion. 
everybody that he needs to greet in Corinth, he's already greeted before by name, probably, and so now he is just saying greetings, uh, and then greet everyone there, and everyone here says you greetings. And so it's very, the, the introduction and conclusion are very short. And he, he starts out with a prayer of comfort, basically, that, you know, that God is the God of comfort, so he starts praying and praying over them that you know, the God is the God of comfort and give thank, gives thanks to God for the comfort that he extends. Uh, and in the context of them being uh, in conflict with each other and now trying to set that aside, that praying to the God of comfort kind of makes sense. So seeing God as, as the God of comfort, the one who gives comfort, is, makes, makes good sense. Uh, and then in chapter 2, he, uh, he expresses his forgiveness for the church and specifically for those that have offended him or that, that might have that done or said something to give offense. Uh, and specifically, this, this guy that they have had to discipline and put out of the church for a while, but the majority has, has, uh, has put out or, or turned away from until he would learn better. Well, he, he's apparently had his, his moment, and he, he has repented and, and has come back. And so Paul is saying, you know, I, I forgive him as, as you have forgiven him. Just make sure that you, know, you, you welcome him back and express your love to him and uh, make sure that he, he knows that he is, he is home. Um, and specifically, the reason to do this is so, so that uh, Satan can't get, can't use this uh, the division or the the conflict as a weapon against this. You know, the, the conflict was for a reason. There was a genuine problem here, but now that the problem is dealt with, and the, the person has has repented, quickly forgive and and go back to loving each other and loving each other as well as you can, so that it's not a tool or a weapon that Satan can use against us. Uh, and then he, he does a whole lot of, uh, he talks quite a bit about the difference between, or the contrasting between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and how the New Covenant is uh, largely this, uh, one main theme in the way he addresses the New Covenant is that it is a, uh, a way of God reconciling himself to us, or us to him. Uh, God, God creating a bridge and a reconciliation between himself and all of us, or all of humanity, uh, through Jesus. And so Paul, Paul's looking at the, uh, the relationship between him and the Corinthian church and this need for reconciliation between them. It's an opportunity for him to talk about the same kind of reconciliation happening between God and humanity, that humanity had, had messed up. Humanity had offended God or had, had done what they, they shouldn't and had, had created a mess, and then God does what is necessary to fix it. Uh, to, to offer reconciliation. And so their, their relationship and the reconciliation between Corinth and Paul can be a kind of uh, an analogy or an embodiment of the, rec the reconciliation between God and all of his people. And in fact, he'll go on in, in chapter 5, kind of, there's a section that is kind of a condensed down uh, highlighting of this, this idea. Uh, in chapter 5, verses 16 and following, uh, when Paul talks about a, the ministry of reconciliation, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. So if anyone is in Christ, they are, they are brand new. So they are a new creation. So we, we treat them in a new way. They, they've repented. You know, we don't hold the old or the past against them. Uh, so if anyone is in Christ, the, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That was God, or that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So if you're not, the word reconciliation is not super familiar. It's, it's the mending of a broken relationship, basically. It's, you, know, you are estranged from your one of your parents and, and you have a conversation and you you make up and, and commit to have a, a better relationship going forward or you start talking to them or you, whatever if, the, if the, a broken relationship is mended, is fixed, then you are reconciled to that person, that is reconciliation and so Paul says you know, this, God has given us this ministry of reconciliation, God has, has given his son in order to be reconciled to us, to make a way for us to be reconciled to him he's offered, offered Jesus for this purpose uh, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so we, God has made this way for us to be reconciled to him, and then given us the ministry of uh, 
proclaiming or teaching about that reconciliation, the message of reconciliation, to all those who don't know, all those who haven't heard and, and haven't understood it yet. And so the, the role that we have as believers, as, as followers of Christ, is to embody this and to, to teach or to show this reconciliation that God has offered through what we do and how we live. And this, us, the Paul and the Corinthian church, that's, that's an opportunity. You know, we, we have been reconciled to each other. We can demonstrate this, this reconciliation uh, through how we, we live with each other and deal with each other. And he, he goes on, and in, in here he describes this as, as the church at Corinth and, and all believers. He says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And so this ministry of reconciliation, the message of reconciliation, God is sending it out through the church, through the believers in the church. And so we are the representatives or the ambassadors for, for Jesus, for this message. And so as we go, we should represent him, represent his interests. Uh, yeah, that, so that's, that's kind of the condensed version or condensed section that deals, right, that describes the... Uh, this ministry of reconciliation that Paul is uh, very happy about or is glad is happening between them. Uh, the next major chunk or next major section uh, Paul deals with over a course of a couple of chapters this, this collection for the church in Jerusalem. Uh, and he spends a couple of chapters going at it partially because it, it looks like the, ch the church did not take him up on his uh, advice in 1 Corinthians to go ahead and start making collecting this offering. And he's planning to come through soon to collect it, and he wants to make sure that it's not a hardship or burden when he shows up. And they had committed at, a, at an earlier point to, to make this offering, but they hadn't prepared for it. They weren't ready for it. Now they're going to have to scramble to come up with it. And he wants to make sure that the offering is given you know, joyfully and gladly and not as a hardship or a burden or an obligation. He wants them to be able to give it joyfully and, and out of love, not not because, you know, it's a debt and they owe it. Uh, and so he, he is encouraging them to you know, make up for lost time and to, to get this, start working on getting this offering together so it won't be such a hardship later. Uh, and he also, uh, he wants to... Uh, Paul is collecting this money for the church in Jerusalem, uh, and part of, he has a couple of different reasons that he wants to do this beyond just helping the church in Jerusalem. One is that Paul has been teaching and preaching and ministering in these mostly Gentile churches because he's been out in these cities that are mostly Gentile populations. There's a synagogue in the city, but it's mostly Gentiles. And so he's in these mostly Gentile churches... And he wants to use this offering, or he wants this offering to be a demonstration of the unity of the body of Christ, even across this Jewish-Gentile line. And so the church, the churches in Gentile areas, and the mostly Gentile churches, sending back an offering for the church in Jerusalem that's mostly Jewish, will kind of cross that bridge and demonstrate that the church is one, that, that it's not divided on that racial or, or ethnic or religious line. Uh, the religious background. They're, they are one people, one body. And then also, Paul sees a willingness to be generous to those that are in need as an expression of the gospel. Uh, that's, that is just a, a great expression of what the gospel is, because in the gospel, Christ who, has, who had everything, who had no need to, to do anything at all, but had everything, gave up everything in order to give to us that had need. Uh, he gave up even his own life in order to meet our need. And so the, a, a fantastic expression of the gospel would be to give up from yourself, to give from yourself to meet someone else's need. And so he sees the willingness to give generously to this kind of an offering as a uh, kind of a diagnostic measure of, of how transformed by the gospel the Church of Corinth has, has been. Uh, and this is very much his, his focus throughout 1 Corinthians, is how the gospel addresses all their issues. And now this, this offering is, is kind of Paul's uh, yardstick to measure how, how much they have, or how fully they've been transformed by the gospel. If they're willing to give generously as they have been given to in Christ, that will demonstrate their, uh, their transformation. And then the last section, uh, <coughs> finishing up the book, 
Uh, Paul deals with a <clears throat> series of accusations or series of things that have been said about him during this conflict over the, the last several issues, you know, from 1 Corinthians to the painful visit, tearful letter. Um, and it looks like basically there was a group of um, a group of people that, or teachers that came through uh, that Paul kind of jokingly or, or mockingly refers to, uh, sarcastically refers to as the super apostles. Um, they came through uh, claiming you know, authority to teach, and they they apparently had like, letters of recommendation from other uh, you know, Jewish synagogues or from other churches in other areas. And they, they, they're really polished, they're very eloquent, they, they just, they look good, they look like good leaders, they, you know, they really look the part. And so they were, they were very impressive. And when they came through, that being very impressive kind of drew some of the Corinthians over to their party, and they, they started listening to them, and, and listening to their teachings, and started to kind of look down on, or to, to be ashamed of Paul, and his much less impressive appearance, and the, the people that traveled with him, like Timothy and Silas and others, uh, that they they weren't up to snuff compared to these you know super apostles, as uh, you know they they just didn't look the part. And so Paul is he he defends himself, but <clears throat> a key thing to to know about Paul's motivations in this section is not that he is is worried about defending his own reputation so much as he wants the church at Corinth to be confident that they have received a good message, that the gospel that they have received is, is trustworthy. And so they, he wants them to be able to trust the source that it came from. And so it's not just that he's trying to defend his own reputation. He wants the church at Corinth to have a kind of settled mind and, and settled hearts around the gospel that they received. And so he defends himself against some of the accusations in order to make sure that they they can they feel like they can trust the source that the gospel came from. And so he, he says, you know, that these these super apostles come through with these with all of these credentials and claim all these credentials that they they know the law, that they have taught the law, that they're great teachers of the law. He says, Well, I can I can say the same and more. I mean, I was I was Pharisee of the Pharisees, and I was trained under Gamaliel, who was one of the the best teachers, best rabbis of the day. You know, I was, I was uh, Gamaliel's disciple. And, and I even had the entirety of the scriptures memorized. And I could, I could quote anything to you. Uh, you know, if, if, it's, if it's a measure of, of being a teacher of the law, I have all of their credentials and then some. Uh, or is it, is it the credentials as a, as a Jew, as a Jewish man? I'm, I mean, I can, I can recite you my entire family tree all the way back. And uh, I, uh, Jew among the Jews uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, you know, and, and a Pharisee among the Pharisees. Was, you know, I, I have the the pedigree or the background. I have the credentials. Uh, you know, whatever they can claim, I I can claim to do even even better. But then he says, but that would be pointless. That would, that would be ridiculous. Uh, if I if I spend all this time boasting about my credentials or my my pedigree or my accomplishments. Then I draw your attention away from where it should be and onto me, because your attention should be on Jesus. Your attention should be on Christ and the content of the gospel and what He did and on the cross, and not on what I can say about myself and what I can do. And so it's you know all of this is is foolishness. The the focus should be on Him. And apparently the some of the super these super apostles that came through they had these letters of recommendation from other places. And when Paul came, he didn't have any letters of recommendation. He was starting a brand new church, and they, said, they come come through these letters of recommendation. And Paul, they say, you know, why, don't, "Why don't you have any recommendation letters? And why, why don't the apostles write you a recommendation?" Uh, and you know, Paul actually had a relationship with the other other apostles. He could have probably gotten letters of recommendation, but he says that that's ridiculous. That's pointless. You know, God. He quotes from the Old Testament. Says, "You know, God wrote, writes on our hearts, and God God has used His Spirit to write on our hearts." He's like. God has written my recommendation letter on your hearts. You received the gospel. You you have been you've heard. You have been changed by it. You've been transformed by it. God has written my recommendation letter on your hearts. You are my recommendation letter. That you have received the gospel. That you are the church and you are in Christ. That is my recommendation letter. I, I, there there is no need for any others. And so Paul he. he he defends himself against these accusations, but it, the way that he does it is always to kind of deflect off of, off of himself and his own accomplishments and credentials 
and on to, to Jesus somehow. So, you know, I have all these credentials too, but to point out all those credentials is foolishness, and you really ought to be paying attention to Jesus and to the cross. And if, you know, I, you want letters of recommendation, my, the letter of recommendation is that you, you have received the gospel and you trust Christ. And so look to that, look to him. That is my letter of recommendation. And so that's his, his way of defending himself or recommending himself is to point back to Jesus, to, to bring them back to Jesus and how he pointed them to Jesus in the first place. So that, that's how he defends himself. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, he does mention having a thorn in the flesh uh, that God gave him this thorn in the flesh to keep him humble or to, to keep him from being arrogant. And that uh, you know, he had asked God to remove it, but God said, this is, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. Uh, and we don't really know what he meant by that. It could have been somebody that just bugged him a lot and that, or that was constantly calling him down, or it could have been some kind of physical infirmity. There's been some suggestion that it may be that Paul was losing his eyesight, that he was, he was becoming blind. Uh, and that's kind of sort of supported by the fact that he was struck blind on the road to Damascus, and then that later some of his postscripts specifically mentioned that he's writing with really large letters in his own hand. Uh, and maybe that's because, you know, as you lose your eyesight, it's easier to write larger because then you can still see what you're writing to some degree. Uh, but we don't really know. That's that's kind of speculative. Uh, and yeah, that's that's the final greetings in first or second Corinthians are really short. There's not much there. Uh, that's where we'll stop. Are there any questions about second Corinthians? Uh, well, the. Uh, I've been asked several times, and so just to make sure that everybody knows and it's clear, uh, the extra credit is available for the second exam. You just have to do the extra credit assignment. Like the first time, uh, print out or in your, just you have to answer in your own handwriting the, the questions from the second test exam uh, or the second test study guide. That's the word I'm looking for. Migraines are not conducive to remember words or anything. Uh, study guide do the second study guide in your own handwriting either by printing it out and writing it in the spaces between or by writing it all in separate paper or whatever however you get it to me is fine as long as it's in your own handwriting and it's complete and correct and that will give you half of the points that you lost on the exam that's it you have any questions i'm up here